Well, <clears throat> standing here, I feel like um, the old one said tuxedo on a pair of brown shoes. You know, you guys are all smart, academic guys that inspire the future, and I'm just a regular doctor, right? <clears throat> Let me give you my last one week. I've had three patients die on my table. I've been cited twice by police officers for speeding, which is neither tax deductible nor reversal. And so, end of the day, it's, it's fascinating to see <clears throat> that the future generation is thinking critically. You're looking at healthcare policy. You're looking at allocation of federal dollars. You're looking at the larger things. And then it boils down end of the day to little guys like me who get paid at 2 in the morning. They've got to get up, drive, and deal with the patient. The last time, we're supposed to open up an infarcted artery when a patient's having a heart attack in 90 minutes. So it's, it's a policy, and if I don't do it, we get dinged on it. So I go into this patient room, and this lady, I'm like, honey, we've got to get you over here because you're having a heart attack. We need to move ahead. She's like, hold on, honey. Don't try to rush me. So, end of the day, when those of you who become doctors or providers, we have to work within the confines of the systems that are available, and then boils down to the day-to-day -day interaction with the patient. And I think uh, the previous speaker's point was taken. It doesn't matter how you categorize drugs, policies, the pharmacotherapeutics. End of the day, you're dealing with the patient. And as, as we will see, I was given an opportunity at some point in time to work with, uh, is there a point on this? Yeah. Okay. So we worked, uh, I'm the chief of cardiology in, uh, on the west side of Chicago, and pretty much the 26th street divides um, African American communities from Latino communities. Almost 95% of our patients are either Latino or African American. So for me to lead a collaborative effort on racial health care disparities was hard because we don't have white folks in our hospital. But when we were addressing this solution, we said, well, why not try to compare this to the historical controls and the rest of the country? So I took upon that responsibility as the project lead of the collaborative effort, which was several years ago, but I thought when Kavi said, why not discuss it? I said, let me share with you the 29-month experience that we had of dealing with the cardiac or cardiovascular disease in the west side of Chicago. And I will tell you uh, from the, the little I know about epidemiology, that uh, the west side of Chicago is one of the worst afflicted areas with cardiac health, as it is with cancer, as it is with outcomes in breast cancer. My wife being an oncologist, I'm aware of those. So uh, even though I'm an interventional cardiologist and a clinician, um, we face and deal with healthcare disparities and the issues of the likes uh, on a daily basis. We've got about 40% immigrant patient population from Eastern Europe, um, of course, uh, South America, Mexico, um, you name it, we've got all kinds of diseases. And we deal with these situations on a practical basis every day. So what I'm hoping to give you is a little, is a pragmatic approach and a practical uh, glimpse into what happens when you deal with, with uh, difficult situations situation. So there was a, a seminal report by the Institute of Medicine in 2003, and, and it states, African American and Hispanic patients are likely to receive a lower quality of health care compared to their white counterparts. It talks about these gaps persist across a range of health care services used to treat different conditions. Should these gaps persist, we will have significant implications in a nation that will have about half of its folks, that would be much, that is so far a minority now. So, right? We need to start thinking about this. You can't have clinical trials, as was pointed out, conducted in the 70s and 80s, where 90% of your subjects, as we call them in clinical trials of patients, are white men recruited from the VA hospitals between the age of 18 and 65. Guess how many white men between 16 and 75 that are healthy, that have no kidney, lung, or other problems do I treat in my practice? Almost none. So, how can I extrapolate the data and apply it to my patients? 
probably can. Yet, yet, I can't tell a patient walking into my emergency room that I don't have data, so honey, I'm not going to feed you. Right? So, 20% of the science we have applicable, available to us in the way of guidelines, publication, whatever that be, funded by the government, funded by a private enterprise, whatever the reasons they may be, for profit, non profit. Barring those limitations, we as clinicians have to deliver health care to all patients. And here's the challenge with that. We talk about disparities, and, and many things have been blamed or, or these have been attributed to many things. Of course, we can talk about health care delivery. Maybe health care systems are providing different health care to white folks than they are to Hispanics or blacks. Maybe. Maybe not. Maybe a patient related. We published a paper where I can tell you that the way different people present their point when I'm about to uh, When patients present, they present different. African American patients tend to present late with their symptoms and do not agree to definitive therapy, angioplasty, open heart surgery, quickly. I've had a patient walk out of the intensive care unit because he had to park his car elsewhere. While some of us in this business find humorous at that moment, there are implications. Eastern European Russians, when their immigrants come in, they, for years they have no problem. They come in, you, you do an angiogram on the first time, they have multi-vessel coronary artery disease, something we would address very early on here. When you offer to them definitive therapy, they would disappear, come back six months later after taking some home remedies and therapies and would present late. Indians, the first time they would come, there would be a plethora of symptoms. You tell them what the problem is, you need an angiogram, then about 15 phone calls come from their family and relatives all over the world. Whoa. Right? Was I taught any of this? Are you going to be taught any of this during your medical school? No. Yet, when I walk into my practice, I have a patient in there, I can't say, well, honey, I can tell you the chemical structure X, Y, E, but I don't know how to treat you because I don't know your cultural background or how you handle the disease or how you do this. And yet, there's, there's room and there's opportunities for growth. But we, as we go into this very dynamic patient population, have to learn how to handle that. So, this is how many doctors know do your residency training, and I happen to be on the vertical integration curriculum event at the Chicago Medical School, uh, and forward that at the Pritzker School in the University of Chicago. You're right. You're right. We do not dedicate any part of our training to dealing with patients with limited English proficiency, or immigrants, if they may have a pretty unique problem that are not common to an average American, or different religious beliefs, don't win. Most doctors don't. Most doctors learn. How would you feel if your attorney, your engineer, the rocket scientist were learning on job? Unnerving, right? Yet, this is the state of affairs. And it isn't because the people who make your equipment in medical school are fools. It's just, it's allocation of priorities. It's competing priorities. Because if you don't get the anatomy and the pathology and the other classes, we believe somehow that the rest of the classes could probably be dispensed and this is more important. So that is the, the basis. It's competing priorities, and, and you will all recognize, no matter what you do in your, in your real life, uh, that those are important issues. Here, let's talk about lack of training and cross-cultural sensitivity. No training addressing patients of different cultures, mistrust, relevant issues were never taught how to deal with a patient, or almost never taught patients who have, don't trust you. Patients will come, hey, one patient comes and like, I want a man of color. I want a white doctor. Okay, well, I'm the only one today, sorry. Or, I've had patients who said, I want a woman doctor. My partner, interventional cardiologist. But I don't want a woman doctor, I want a man doctor. We have no way of addressing those in a sensitive manner because there's no training given to us. So that's the practical part of things. So you will face that as you go right, into hospitals as patients or as providers. Um, anyway, we thought there were some proposed solutions. Uh, request for proposal came in from Robert Wood Johnson Institution. They said, okay, if we consistently treat everyone the same, sort of like the rising tide uh, raises all the boats, maybe that would help. And it's, they use cardiac health because cardiologists are known to publish many trials 
most of the money, private enterprise money, goes into cardiac because it is the number one cause. We've got a lot of guidelines, we have more publications. And therefore, um, because we know that evidence of disparity exists, and because we have measurable lifestyle guidelines, and because it is the commonest cause of death and disability, um, this program, amongst many, many, many others over the years, was launched. It was a Robert Wood Johnson funding source at the National Program Office with Washington University of Ohio State doing the institutional assessment and for the Center for Health and Public Services and NYU did the evaluation. And the idea was they left it open. They called us during the request for proposal and they said, listen, whoever's writing this proposal, come up with an innovative idea where you can measure or find a way to measure racial disparities, fix them, or find solutions to fix them, and then see if you can sustain them. Because the point isn't just writing a paper. The point is, can you learn something from it? I mean, that is the concept. So the following organizations were selected. Um, we happen to be in Mount Sinai, Chicago. And these were the phases. And again, the point isn't to show you what we did. The point is that efforts are made. We do some, uh, this is our team. I happen to run this program at that time. And, and just to tell you that science does exist. And there are meaningful things you can do to patients. So based on about a million patients studied in prospective randomized trials, we know if you did these 10 things, you can reduce the mortality, in hospital mortality. Let me be correct. So when patients come in with heart attack or heart failure, if you did these aspirin, these are class of drug angiotensin receptor blockers, beta blockers, smoking cessation, very simple thing. If you do angioplasty rather quickly, if you provide them discharge instructions, i.e., what to do after you leave the hospital. Very intuitive, right? Most, most of you think, what are you talking about? Let me tell you, the biggest challenge is this. Absolutely the biggest challenge is across hospitals. We know how to do angioplasty, we know how to do surgery, we know how to put stents in. When patients leave the hospital, we just drop them where they go. They have no idea where to go, they have no idea where the appointments are. The ladies come in with multiple medications and you can go talk to your grandma. The problem is there. We don't have an effective solution for that. So anyways, by doing all of this, we were able to demonstrate that over this period of time, all these life-saving therapies can be improved. It's not that we didn't know about these therapies. It, we all knew it. I teach my fellows all the time. We know the guidelines exist. Why did we, how were we able to do it? And, and that's the point I'm trying to drive across. And that's why you guys are so very important in this is, Right. Okay. So how did we do it? If you look at the large piece of it is enhanced provider variance. So because we had the program, we got everyone in the health system and sent emails and we did everything and we said that's why we're doing it. We also said give us additional money, the resources. We had a case manager, we had folks who could do those kinds of things. But most importantly, we had leadership made an institutional priority. So it's important for very smart people like you in this room who have the ability to change and steer the policy, the future of where things happen. If we make it a priority, if institutions, if leadership, if governing bodies make it a priority that we have to solve the solution, do this, take care of this problem, it can be done. We did it in a very small system. We did it effectively, but we couldn't do it without leadership's input or from allocation resources. So doctors can do what they do. I recognize there are limitations in our curriculum as we're taught, but that's why we need policy leaders, thought leaders, and, and, and folks like yourselves who are here who are willing to put in time and effort to direct the right kind of resources so that your peers, your colleagues, and folks like us can actually use the resources and take their patients. And I think I will stop here. Thank you.